It is Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was yet another non-virtual get-your-ass-kicked at Jiu-Jitsu Wednesday. I uh, did not do any ass-kicking. Um, did not get my ass kicked. Although that's not a, it's not a point of pride for me. I, I actually intended to stay a little bit after the session today, but unfortunately, the session dragged on a bit longer than I had intended, and uh, my training partner did not alert me to the time until it was already 17 minutes past the hour. So, pretty much sucked up the time that that I had intended on de- dedicating to getting in a roll or two today. But I do intend to go tomorrow and resolve that little issue because getting my ass kicked or not, I, I need to get I need to get more fucking rolls in, man. I need to do it. You know, it's like uh I don't know. I just I got some stupid aversion that I gotta get over. You know, and, and I don't really understand it honestly because I've I've cleared this hurdle a couple of times. And, of course, I could probably document it by going back and, and uh, just listening to some of the shows that I was doing while I was still working out at the other gym. Is You know, after I, uh, after I got my blue belt, I got a little bit more dedicated to, uh, to what I was doing. And uh, one of the things that was kind of helping me along was I was going in at 6 o'clock in the morning and working out with this one gentleman. But I... I really couldn't get in two, two rolls in it. I couldn't get in two classes in a day. I just couldn't. It was either roll with him in the morning or come in in the evening. And it was like, I, I couldn't do both. <laughs> but I, um, it, going in like that on in the morning, it, it gave me an opportunity to work with somebody who was knowledgeable in the material already. And so, you know, it wasn't one of those things where I'm like looking at my partner and my partner's looking at me and we're like, uh, you know, what what are we supposed to be doing? You know, it's like he always came to the table with something that he wanted to work on, you know, and so that, that was, that was a bit of a relief, you know, in, in that I didn't have to bring anything myself, you know, that he, he actually had something that he wanted to take care of or, or, or work on and, um, and I felt like that really helped my my game because it was forcing me to do a lot of things that were not necessarily normal to me. In that, you know, his body type was different from mine, and so his focus and his game was different from mine. And so when we would be doing stuff that he wanted to do instead of stuff that I wanted to do, it wasn't necessarily stuff that I was I was comfortable with or familiar with. And so it was, it was very educational. You know, I feel like like calling and messaging the man and saying, "Hey, man, can we can we just do some six o'clock a.m. classes?" I don't know. the The place that I'm the the people that I'm training with now they do have the the option of uh, of going to a five a.m. class, and I have not availed myself of that yet. I may sometime in the future. I don't know. 5 a.m. is like 6 a.m. was bad enough, but like 5 a.m. was when I would get up to go <laughs> to a class at 6 a.m. So, yeah, it's it's that whole thing. And and the other thing was when I was doing those 6 a.m. classes, I'd just be destroyed for the rest of the day. You know, it's like I I would come home and I would fall asleep. I'd wake up and be fucking noon. You know, and so that's part of my hesitance with with regard to going in that early in the morning is just just fucking wreck me for the rest of the day but uh yeah as far as the material that we went over today uh, we are starting from a north south position and navigating from a north south to a triangle setup and then from the triangle setup getting the the opponent getting free of the triangle and uh, closing out an arm triangle or closing out with an arm triangle and there, there were a few points where where I was 
I was having quite a few issues, and and mostly in the in the part with uh, with trying to get my feet up over my head and connecting with my opponent in such a way that I was like scissoring his, his head and his arm like pressure wise to to get it around to that that uh, triangle position, and I was getting kind of fluid with it towards the end, but I think I was skipping a step in that. I'm supposed to like set up with with both feet on one side of my opponent's torso where I've got like the the back of his neck hooked with with I think it's my right foot where and having my left foot on his chest and extending outward and and this this is one spot I kept I kept kind of waffling on where I kept missing it and the the intention there is that you can keep your retention of your opponent and still push the other leg through to uh, to get that into the triangle position i was having a lot of trouble with that so one adaptation is to grab a hold of your opponent's arms and so you're pushing and pulling then you know this time instead of pushing and pulling with just your legs also pushing and pulling with your arms. Personally, I feel that was that was a a uh, adaptation that not only made the the transition into the triangle easier for me, but I think that that's one of those things where I would want to do that just to be able to negate my my opponent's position. You know, they're they're migrating from that position. So like I said, it was grabbing both of our opponent's hands and and popping their, their upper body up, you know, popping their upper body up, hands on the hips, and, and then bringing the feet up when they, they posture up a little bit and grabbing their hands at that time and then putting the one foot over the collar, one foot on the chest, and then the foot on the chest, pushing it through the opposite armpit like the the like you know extending your legs to where your opponent is maximum distance away from you and really opening up that gap under their armpit and then shooting with the the uh, foot that is not behind their neck shooting that through under their armpit and spinning around under them and coming out into a triangle now that that one in particular I had a lot of trouble with and and anything that's that involves putting my feet up above my head is is always been something that's kind of challenging for me (laughs) so you know it was it was a little bit of an adventure (laughs) but yeah so that and uh, the the part that I really liked though was starting from the um, from a full mount position like his from from the escape from the triangle you do a neon belly and then a like a supreme back step to where you're you're mounted on your opponent facing them and so like from there the the next step is ha- being flat on your opponent hooked with your your right arm or actually for for this one I was doing it with my left arm where I had my left arm hooked under his neck and, and really had that tied into the the uh, head there, you know, where I, I had my my bicep riding right on his neck, and so and there from there I liked doing something that wasn't really instructed, but I felt like it really helped things out, especially in getting the arm up to getting it into an arm triangle position. Is I reached all the way through to where I was able to grab a hold of the bottom of my my opponent's peck basically and I was really scrunching it in and and had his head really tied up there and I had my head tied into him so it's like he he was he was not going anywhere you know and I had it trapped in such a way that forcing that arm up to where I could get it into a triangle position was really not that difficult and it's one of those things where you kind of like migrate it to the outside with and doing like spider fingers under their arm to to get them to extend it straight up over their head so that you can lock in the triangle. Well, 
on this one, I personally, even if somebody does get their their hand up to their head, I mean, you know, to where they're answering the phone or something like that. A lot of times, if I get the angle right, I can still close out that triangle. And one of the one of the things I do is I make sure that I get my hands in that same position that you would get for the the um, rear naked choke, and and really push down on that that elbow. You know, like put your hand on, on put your head on the other side of the hand, and push it down. And I, I think that that makes a bigger difference as far as closing out an arm triangle. Because if if nothing else. You can get the, enough pressure on on certain parts of somebody's neck where it's really uncomfortable. And if you happen to trap it with the jaw, it's even less comfortable, man. I mean, you get squoze hard enough that way. You just, you're like, tap, tap, get the fuck off me. <laughs> but yeah, so that was, um, I really enjoyed that part. But there's a, a way to get them in the event that they're able to get that hand up there and block the the triangle choke where you take your right hand and you grab the hand that they've got next to their ear and you guide that arm over their head so now the elbow is pointing straight up right and so you've got the arm hooked under their neck still right and so you, you just hook that into your bicep let go of that hand and then come back around and catch that same elbow the the elbow for the hand that you just on the on the arm of the hand that you just disengaged and you push that forward and squeeze it in and that that'll close out that choke without an arm there to get in your way but yeah i I really enjoyed that last part of the choke I really enjoyed that one a lot because I felt like I could get it really, 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 really tight. Of course, I don't think my opponent appreciated that very much, but <laughs> nonetheless, I'm not there for his comfort. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw it down with some music. And you know, if for some stupid reason, we never got around to body count last time. And I mean, now, I have shifted from doing them as first dance. But that's only because I, I've been I've been like I've been playing the fucking Steel Panther instead. But that, I'm not asking for forgiveness there. But for whatever reason, we just we never got around to body count last time. So of course that's what we're gonna start off with this time. And uh, I'm I'm in a in a toss up now. I, I don't know whether to go with Bum Rush or Colors 2020. Let's go with Bum Rush especially given the events of the Fed today. So here it is. First dance, body count, bum rush, here on Coin Metal. And that was Vola with the same war. <coughs> Man, been smoking way too much. Wow. Anywho, as far as what we're going to get into today... I uh, I spent the last few days like clicking on pretty much every article that that interested me, and uh, <laughs> we came up with a couple good ones today. And I think all told, we have a a cohesive show. In the, in assuming, of course, we get through all of it. I, I got a lot of material today. Anyway, so the first thing is on uh, decrypt.co. India's RBI says cryptocurrencies can cause financial instability. And uh, this is by Shana, or yeah, Shana Shara, Sharya, Sharya Malwa. Um, I don't know, that sounds. Let's check and verify something really quick here. Ah! Yes. Penis. Anyway, this is authored on February 24th, 2021. Here we go. The Reserve Bank of India, the country's central bank, says cryptocurrencies may impact the region's financial stability, as per a report this morning on financial publication Bloomberg. RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das said cryptocurrencies were a, quote, major concern 
adding that the bank had highlighted the points to the country's central government. The statements marked the second instance issued by the RBI with regards to crypto, the crypto market in two weeks. Man, they must be panicked. <clears throat> Last week, the Indian administration proposed a blanket ban on all private current cryptocurrencies and called for the creation of a framework for an official digital currency issued by the RBI instead. Doss confirmed that development today, stating that the bank RBI was, quote, very much in the game in that regard. He added the project was, quote, receiving our full attention and that both the technical and regulatory aspects were currently being worked on. Despite the negative comments, crypto proponents were continuing to fight for the cause. Local crypto exchanges and crypto lawyers have formed a legal coalition in the past years to work with the government to help create a regulated, safe framework for the use of cryptocurrencies in the country. That's a big mistake. It's a big fucking waste of time. Anyway, continuing on. Any technology can be misused. Some high-ranking officials have joined in on the movement as well. Quote, It can be a true, great, a true game changer for India. Indeed, Bitcoin can be misused, but so can Google Maps. Don't ban it. Regulate it smartly, said Dr. Shri... Srivatsa Krishna, an official of the country's premier civil services agency, the Indian Administrative Service, in a report published earlier this week. <clears throat> Christian, uh, Krishna questioned the government's pr pessimist approach to cryptocurrencies and warned that citizens could lose out on a, quote, wealth creation opportunity. He further added that the government simply did not understand the potential of cryptocurrencies and was instead taking the, quote, safer route of banning the sector outright. The country had previously ban barred all state-owned and private banks to transact with crypto exchanges in 2018, but the Supreme Court later overturned that dictum in May 2020. While this served as a brief respite, the anti-crypto narrative has swiftly returned. Yeah, it doesn't mean that it's actually going to gain any traction this time either. Dude, <clears throat> you're facing a constituency that's looking at the price of Bitcoin rise and watching their own fucking currency tank, and they're like, <clears throat> I want to retain some of this monetary value that I've got before you fuckers uh, whittle it away to nothing with printing. I mean, really, it's it's not that that difficult to see the balance here. In India, has faced this multiple times where their, their government or one of their finance ministers or somebody else will say something to the effect of, we got to ban Bitcoin, we got to regulate Bitcoin more. <laughs> No, we don't. What is it that regulation is supposed to bring to the market that is supposed to make things safer? What is it? There really isn't anything. In the truth of the thing, there isn't anything a regula regulatory entity can do to stop anybody from engaging in whatever behavior they wish, especially where, where it pertains to crypto. <clears throat> and where they, where they can introduce any kind of pressure whatsoever on the market, you experience a negative withdrawal there. You know, where you see these these entities, like say Coinbase or whatever, you know, where, where they're getting to a point where like things with ICOs, uh, DeFi, whatever, they're having to ke play catch up with this stuff. They can't be adventurous. They can't be wild and open. And the reason they can't be is because 
their regulatory proxies won't allow them to. You know, they're they're licensed through the NYDFS and a few other entities to operate within the United States. And in again with with regard to their their licensure with regard to the NYDFS, it's my understanding that Goldman is acting as their their regulatory proxy. So basically Goldman has their hand up their ass and if if Goldman wants something to happen, they just phone up Coinbase and it fucking happens. <clears throat> and Coinbase is not the only exchange that has this kind of relationship with with heavy handed financiers. What we can think is the fact that uh, a significant amount of the liquidity floating around out there is actually from crypto entrepreneurs, so... <sighs> there's... There's that. Anyway, so yeah, India. Still on the fence. Still doesn't know whether they want to make it illegal or live on it or make their own or whatever. But in another year or two, we're going to be in the same position where we are now. That's That's just my prediction, by the way. That... In another year, they will have not gone anywhere either. They'll vote it through, vote through the ban, and then later have it challenged in their Supreme Court and rescinded, or they won't even waste their time with it. It'll sit on a shelf, it'll gather dust, people will forget about it, and, and we'll get on with, with things. I, I really believe that that's like the, the ultimate answer for a lot of these people that are. They're saying, oh, we ought to regulate this shit more. Eh, no. This shit regulates itself. The market decides what it wants. And to the extent that the market is right or wrong, that's really nothing that regulations can fix. You know, there's winners and there's losers. This is not a... There's nothing guaranteed about investment. Not even in legacy markets, for that matter. So, why why anybody would expect some sort of higher standard of such in crypto is just is beyond me. Anyway, <clears throat> next up, got something here on CoinDesk. Outage at the Fed delays bank wire transfers affecting crypto exchanges. And this is by uh, Nathan D. Camillo, and it was authored on February 24th, 2021, at 11.08 a.m. PST. But yes, penis. The U.S. Federal Reserve's payment network for sending wires and settling those transactions in real time is down, according to FBRServices.org. Quote, a Federal Reserve operational error resulted in disruption of service in several business lines, said Richmond Fed spokesperson Jim Strader. Quote, we are restoring services and are communicating with all Federal Reserve Financial Services customers about the status of operations. In a post on Wednesday, the central bank said it's investigating service disruption to Fedwire, Fed ACH, and National Settlement. As a result, cryptocurrency exchanges like Gemini, Kraken, and possibly Coinbase are seeing delays in Fedwire and automated clearinghouse transactions. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <clears throat> These are among the same entities that are that are, you know, saying that we need to, you know, get all hard on, on cryptocurrency regulation and whatnot, and so, yeah. <sighs> anyway, I gotta check something really quick. <sighs> right now. There we go. Okay. And so, yeah, that was short and sweet. Thank you, Nathan. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so... I've got another one of these around here somewhere that I wanted to get into. No. no. Yeah, here we go. 
you know, it's like they're they can't even manage the systems that they've currently got. And and they're competing with things like Bitcoin and Dogecoin that have that have had like a a ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent fucking uptime since their inception. And, and and they and yet they still want to take on even more. Oh Jesus Christ, dude! Look, dude, I am live on a show right now. Leave whatever here, and I'll get to it later. There you go. All right. So now the next thing I got here, it's on uh, Forbes.com. Fed Chair Powell says, digital dollar is a high-priority project. We just got to have it. And this is by Sarah Hansen. So no, no penis. And uh, this is authored on February 23rd, 2021. And so let's see. Oh, damn it. Why did you do that? Don't do fucking bullet points. I hate fucking bullet points. Motherfucker. Institutional interest in cryptocurrency grows following Bitcoin's blistering rally at the beginning of the year. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said the central bank is looking closely at the prospect of issuing a, quote, digital dollar. Digital central bank currencies are forms of money issued by a country's central bank that exist entirely electronically without any connection to physical banknotes or coins. They're different from decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which aren't controlled by one central player, though some of the underlying technology is the same. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen expressed that same view on Monday, quote, Too many Americans don't have access to easy payment systems and banking accounts, and I think this is something that a digital dollar, a central bank digital currency, could help with. Yellen also suggested that a digital central currency could help make payments faster, safer, and cheaper, That's because proponents of the technology say it will help simplify complicated, often days-long settlement processes. Powell said Tuesday that since the U.S. dollar serves as the world's reserve currency, it's more important to get the project right than it is for the United States Central Bank to be the first to unveil a digital version of its currency. They wouldn't be the first anyway. Crucial quote, quote, We're looking carefully, very carefully, at the question of whether we should issue a digital dollar, Paul said on Tuesday. Tangent. China is testing its own version of a digital yuan, and earlier this month distributed 10 million yuan, about 1.5 million U.S. dollars, as part of a major test for the project, CNBC reported. Key background, Bitcoin has soared to record highs this year as major corporations like BlackRock, BlackRock, BNY Mellon, and Tesla have announced new moves into cryptocurrencies. Not everyone is bullish on the most popular cryptocurrency, which is incredibly volatile and prone to wild price swings. Earlier this year, Bank of America called Bitcoin's rapid rise, quote, the mother of all bubbles. <laughs> Bitcoin prices plunged 7% over the weekend after Tesla CEO Elon Musk, a constant proponent of the technology on social media, said prices were, quote, a little high. Dude, he was a little high. And so, I think that's it. Let's see if there's any comments on this. Nope. Yeah. So yeah, there you have it. 
They they can't even manage their own systems, their, their current existing systems, and they want to take on managing a, a CBDC on top of that. Personally, I believe all the CBDCs are going to get wrecked. That they're going to try to do something similar to Bitcoin, only they're not going to have a, a consensus of a network of dis disparate entities conducting their, their transactions for them. And I, I think that the, the underlying error of trying to assume that under one umbrella, i.e. the Federal Reserve, um, that, that that in itself will bear out why this is a bad idea. But, you know, we've already seen CBDCs. It's nothing new. You know, we've already seen quote-unquote nation coins. Only they were smart and previously, and they said, we're not going to have a direct association with the, the fiat currency for this country. And I think it was, um, it might have been Portugal or Spain tried it. Um, the Navajo Nation tried it. Um... And there, there have been a few others where some people have gotten together and said we are going to create a digital currency that is for use within this geography or this grouping of people and to some extent it may work for a little bit like Navajo coin was around for a little while um, but then it turned into Nav coin and then I think Nautilus coin and I have no idea what it is today but the, the, the point being that these projects n never really stay around because when you're, when you're talking about a, a CBDC or a nation coin, you're talking about a coin that for whatever reason, it's, it's interest, it's scope of interested parties. It's like pre-selected and pre-limited. And to the extent that, that like Navcoin, I think it was, or Navajo coin, um, to the extent that that was available to everybody to purchase and trade and mine and all that other stuff. That That's where it was kind of different from projects like the Petro or the Digital Yuan and so on and so forth. You know, but what it, again, what it turns out though in indicating is that altcoins, things like Dogecoin or Verge, they have more distribution. They they have more success versus these other projects. And on top of that, there there are groupings of like people that could be involved in it. So like types of partnerships that could be set up. They're they're not really limited with Verge or Doge or a number of other cryptocurrencies out there. You know, the, and you can set up your own interests, your own markets. You know, if you have enough, enough people that are interested in what you're doing and are willing to, to participate in this kind of thing, you can create your own local economies and where you do need some additional, like, monetary unit you could be utilizing these cryptocurrencies as substitutes. And if you're mining them, that's even better. You can create a closed loop economy among you and your friends and not, and not involve anybody, not involve a, a tax man, not involve the IRS, not involve the government, nobody. And this is the type of power that's in the hands of the average person these days. You know, I, and I, I believe that in the not-so-distant future, we're going to be seeing even more expressions of this. Where we're going to see a reversion of interest back into altcoins, specifically ones that will suit the same use cases as things of like Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, you know, where you're able to shift your project from Ethereum 
over to another another cryptocurrency's blockchain and and not suffer any issues. But I, I think that we'll see that, and then after a while we'll see that it's the the, the cryptocurrencies that exist are good, and some of them are even excellent, and will and will endure for decades, if not centuries more. But that there are certain things that the market needs that even Satoshi did not envision. You know, some capability or some some parameter alteration, you know, such as like maybe a no block size limit or something like that. That will might be necessary in the future for, for whatever reason. The market will decide this though. And that we'll see a series of, of copycats and some of them will go by, go by the wayside and some of them will actually bring something unique to the table and justify their continued existence in the market. Uh, I Yeah, like I said, I, I wholeheartedly believe that that is, uh, that is yet in our future. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down with some music. And you know we didn't get into any sixth yet. And I think it's time for that. But what song? Here we go. Vivid. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Textures with Oceans Collide. And so, what else we got here? <clears throat> Next thing I got is on Coindesk.com. U.S. Central Bank explains, quote, preconditions for a digital dollar. And uh, this is by Danny Nelson and Nicholas D. So, double penis. And uh, this is authored on February 24th, 2021 at 3.04 p.m. PST. Hours after the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell declared 2021 to be a pivotal year in consulting the public on the digital dollar, his underlings issued a paper describing what that consultation might look like. In a Wednesday Fed's notes, Federal Reserve Senior Counsel Jess Cheng Payments Specialist Angela L. N. Larson, Lawson rather, and Technology Lab Manager Paul Wong said the onus would be on broadly engaging the public the pros and cons of a U.S. central bank digital currency. Privacy issues, ease of use, security access, and delivery mechanisms should all be on the table as Fed officials work to, quote, sharpen a digital dollar with the public's health, the paper said. Any consultation should likewise be as broad a cross-section of the U.S. population as possible, quote, engaging with individuals and businesses and consulting with consumer groups, community organizations, and business associations to understand the use case for a CBDC will help in the decision whether to issue a CBDC and its potential design, the authors wrote. Think tanks and academia could also play a supporting role, they said. Authors also outlined the basic, quote, preconditions essential to the Fed's deliberations on how to proceed. Digital Dollar Clarity the Fed would need to clearly understand what a possible CBDC would be used for, the notes said. The technology used would also, would also have to support the CBDC across different conditions while providing 24-7 instant settlement, secure transfer of assets, and resilience. Feedback should be drawn from, quote, end users of various ages, geographic locations, payment habits, and financial literacy in the design and testing of a CBDC could help sharpen the basic features 
of a viable CBDC arrangement, the note stated. Its authors admitted a CBDC could grant the central bank, quote, unprecedented access into the financial goings-on of its users if designed to allow the most, quote, granular transaction information shine through. Quote, this close linkage between money and data constraints with physical banknotes, which do not carry with them transaction data, that can be connected to a specific person and their history of financial dealings, the note said. Congressional Oversight Congress would have to authorize the Federal Reserve to issue a general purpose CBDC, the note said. Fed Chair Powell echoed this view in testimony before the House Financial Services Committee Wednesday telling lawmakers the Fed would need to, quote, would need legislative authorization. Any digital dollar would be controlled as a centralized project by the Federal Reserve, though the actual nodes would be distributed, said, said James Kuna, a senior vice president at the Boston branch of the U.S. Central Bank. The Boston Fed has been evaluating different technology platforms, including blockchain tools, with the MIT Digital Currency Initiative to determine what platform would be best suited to supporting a digital dollar. However, support for the idea of a digital dollar, whether blockchain-based or not, seems to be growing. According to who? Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said, quote, It makes sense for central banks to consider issuing their own digital currencies earlier this week. Dude, like I said before, there's been plenty of examples of this before, and they fall flat on their face. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure the digital yuan really isn't doing all that great. Otherwise, China would be bragging the shit out of it right now. Anyway, continuing on, quote, Too many Americans don't have access to easy payment systems and banking accounts, and I think this is something that a digital dollar, a central bank digital currency, could help with, she said at New York Times conference on Monday, while also dismissing Bitcoin as being an inefficient system for payments. Wednesday's paper dropped just after a Fed wire outage, that saw banks unable to transfer funds, some crypto exchanges were unable to process ACH transactions during the outage. And let's hit that one too. Or did we already cover it? We may have. Oh no, we didn't. Here we go. Fedwire is back online after outage that affected crypto exchanges and others. And uh, this is by uh, Nathan Nathan D. Camille. It might be the one we already covered. I don't know. We'll find out. February 24th, 2021 at 1243 p.m. PST. The U.S. Federal Reserve has restored access to its real-time settlement system for central bank money. The outage affected wire transfers that were in the process of being settled or already in the queue. During the outage, cryptocurrency exchanges, including Gemini, Kraken, and Coinbase, were seeing delays in some transactions. Those problems should now be resolved. Quote, the Fedwire Fund Service, Fedwire Security Service, and National Settlement Service have resumed processing and are operating normally, the central bank wrote in an updated note. The Federal Reserve Banks have taken steps to ensure the resilience of the Fedwire and NSS applications, including recovery to the point of failure. Hmm. This kind of failure is very rare for bankers to experience. Quote, Maybe it's happened to us twice in 11 years, Steve Schnall, CEO of Manhattan-based Quantic, Quantic Bank, said, said. 
Quantic, a separate banker's bank with, diff with direct access to the Fed, was able to handle its wires during the downtime, Schnall said. Quote, I'm not sure if many or all have such a relationship, Schnall said. The bigger banks wouldn't need a correspondent bank as they typically have direct, direct access to the Fed. <laughs> it's all about them relationships. You know, um, that's one of the advantages of cryptocurrencies is that they're permissionless. If you want to become a miner, you can become a miner. You, you just you buy the hardware, you set up an account, and you mine. That's all there is to it. Nothing terribly complicated. However, <laughs> you know, if you're, this is this is something to to keep in mind when uh, when contemplating the idea of a CBDC. These are people that had two major disruptions over the last eleven years. Well, what else has been going on for the last 11 years? Bitcoin has had 100% uptime, or damn near 100%. I think it's like 99.9999999998% percent uptime it, over, the, over the duration of its existence. And so, I mean, what, what does that tell you? You know, it tells me that the individuals that are running the Fedwire system are not properly incentivized. Or at least the, the, the relationships with certain entities is better than others. There's a tiered permission here where some have higher levels of access, i.e. higher levels of permission to participate on those networks, and then those with <clears throat> with a more limited access. They don't have the, the premium platinum membership that allows them direct access to the Fed systems. And see, I don't think that a, a CBDC is going to change that. I think that there are always going to be favorited positions and favorited accesses and premium accesses and whatnot that are going to be ruled in a subjective manner and as the Fed sees fit. And this is an inefficiency in the market, a manipulation in the market, or a manipulation point in the market that is wholly unavoidable by everybody that is involved in using U.S. dollars, or Federal Reserve notes, rather. And so the idea that we're going to see some improvement on this condition by exchanging one payment medium network for another is, is fucking ludicrous. And I think that, that the assumption here is that a CBDC is going to be somehow better than the current systems that we have and the current currency that we have. And the problem is, is that it'll be ruled by the same people in probably the same, same facilities that the last network was hosted and be subject to not only all the issues that they previously had, but the new ones that are included by trying to do it in a blockchain manner. You know, the, I, I think about it a lot as far as like what, what type of exploits might be out there. And we see exploits all the time in, in Ethereum. And it's because I think, I think on, on that point, that it's relatively easy with doing stuff in in a off chain manner, you know. So all of the the ERC twenty tokens when they're being exchanged on the on the DeFi exchanges and all that business, that there's limited contact needed with the Ethereum blockchain in it, and it's that that lapse in the the 
trust association with cryptocurrencies or the replacement of trust, the things that we've replaced trust with in cryptocurrencies. It kind of kind of get it goes a little bit outside of that. And so fuckery like the, the exploits that we've seen are possible on it. And see, this, this fact is not going to change just because the Federal Reserve assumes they are the only ones with access to their network. And I can guarantee you, if, if there is a high enough incentive, there will be entities that access that network that are not authorized... <laughs> And it'll just be a it'll be a matter of an exploit that exists for whatever cryptocurrency, or whatever whatever platform currency that they're they're considering using as their base layer. And there just there hasn't been a high enough incentive to utilize it yet. But as soon as there is. And I mean, there's people dreaming up theoretical implementations all the time of exploits that they could be executing on a very a wide variety of networks and other softwares out there. You know, that's that's all they do. It's just try and make software misbehave and, and do shit that it wasn't designed to do and, and shit that they wanted to do as opposed to, again, what it was originally intended for. And that this threat, it, it only escalates the more value you put on it. It's a matter of incentives. You know, in Bitcoin, we get around that by saying, you know, if you want to participate in the network, you're gonna, it's going to require some hardware. Well, what that means for you is, is if you do invest in the hardware, what it means for you is that if you fuck up, if you, if you just miss the blocks, if you, if whatever mining pool you're in, it's not getting the blocks, not getting the block rewards. That alone means that you're not going to make money. So now, you know, if you if you're taking all those resources and you're dedicating the, some nefarious purpose on one of these networks, the risk that there's an actual failure that you you won't actually succeed in your endeavor and and will in fact eat a lot of cost for it goes way up so you know it, it's it's this incentive thing it's like okay well you know we can endure the risk we we might actually achieve it and, but if we do what's the chances that we're going to be able to walk away with our profits before everybody else notices and, and tries to cash out as quick as they possibly can. And, and what, what's the likelihood that that's going to limit our ability to get the most Roy out of the situation? <laughs> you know, it's a game of incentives. And these threats don't go away just because it's your own little personal network that's tucked away off and, and you know, you're assuming that you're, you're the only one with any access to it. Nobody has any reason to try and hack it. No. <laughs> you're just transferring trillions of dollars every other day. No, no incentive here. Give me a break. And like I said, the, the chances are that there is an exploit out there for whatever software implementation they intend to use and there just hasn't been a high enough incentive placed on utilizing it they're waiting for somebody to put some some real bread on the table and then they'll pounce anyway and so you know I got this thing here and uh I think this this indicates a little more of the truth than some would like to admit. And uh, this is on BitcoinMagazine.com. Janet Yellen sounds like she's scared of Bitcoin. And this is by Ben Jarvie. And it was authored on February 24th, 2021. So yes, penis. This week, CNBC published a headline that recently appointed U.S. Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen 
sounds warning about extremely inefficient Bitcoin. Ironically, two days later, CNBC published another article because the Federal Reserve Systems are down. The article amplified her criticism of Bitcoin's value and energy consumption. The kicker is that it does so without actually comparing it to anything, which is absurd. So, here I am to address this one-sided journalism and lack of research. Oh my god, maybe I got a listener. Quote, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen issued a warning Monday about the dangers that Bitcoin poses both to investors and the public, CNBC reported. It then noted that Elon Musk's Tesla had purchased $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin before pivoting back to Yellen, reporting that she said, quote, there remain important questions about legitimacy and stability. Quote, I don't think that Bitcoin is widely used as a transaction mechanism, Yellen told CNBC. (laughs) You can verify that every day. To be able to report this statement, you might think that CNBC would quantify Bitcoin's total throughput, usually in comparison to something else, but but perhaps that's wishful thinking. Quote, I fear it's often for illicit finance, Yellen proceeded to tell CNBC. It's an extremely inefficient way of conducting transactions, and the amount of energy that's consumed in processing those transactions is staggering. Let's break this down. <clears throat> Quote, it's illicit finance. There is no comparison of Bitcoin to another currency in regards to how often it is used for nefarious purposes. How much illicit finance... Oh, and also there's the subjective subjectivity of what exactly illicit finance is. You know, it could be somebody buying, buying drugs on the dark web and it could be somebody trying to buy groceries in Bolivia. Continuing. There is no comparison of Bitcoin to another currency. Okay, we, yeah, we got all that. How, how much illicit financing is conducted with the U.S. dollar, or any other currency for that matter? How could you even begin to quantify that with the anonymity of cash? Quote, extremely inefficient. Once again, this lacks any comparison to even be deemed as so, and in reality is proven to be the opposite. Bitcoin is a bearer asset, not the echo of a paper IOU. It may take 10 minutes and cost a little bit of money to settle on the base layer, but that is for, quote, final settlement. What are the costs for sovereigns to do this? There are no secondary layers to Bitcoin which enable global transactions instant. Oh, I'm sorry. There are secondary layers to to Bitcoin which enable global transactions instantly in any currency or money and cost a fraction of a cent. No, that's not true. That's not true. You're not counting the, the transaction fees in that statement. Anyway, continuing on. Comparing this to the cost and time requirements of traditional finance and remittances, it is clearly extremely more efficient. And and yeah, back to that secondary layer business, it's not truly instant. It may read as instant in your your quote-unquote lightning wallet, and all the in all the participants nodes that are that are on the uh, that are on the uh, what was a payment channel that you're involved in but until final settlement it it hasn't actually happened yet so if it doesn't finally settle you don't get your fucking money continuing on staggering energy consumption Again, without any comparison, the, this point is just wrong. I thought Nick Carter had, had the last word when he wrote that, quote, Bitcoin energy warriors 
need not despair, however, there is a solution. All they must do is persuade Bitcoin fans to use and value an alternative settlement medium. Their best bet will be to devise a system that is even more secure, offers even stronger assurances, settles faster, and is more privacy preserving and is more censorship resistant, all without using proof of work. Such a system would be miraculous. I'm waiting to be hated with. Br- oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm waiting with bated breath. Yeah, that's not going to happen. The article then moved on to Bitcoin's volatility. Yellen stated, quote, "It's a highly speculative asset, and you know, I think people should be aware that it can be extremely volatile, and I do worry about potential losses that investors can suffer." <laughs> Yeah, whatever. Do you worry about the loss of buying power that we experience when trillions of additional dollars are borrowed from the Federal Reserve? I don't think so. Continuing, she is worried about the world's best performing asset over the last decade. It is a decentralized global monetary system and unit going through the monetization process with a constant price identification 24-7. What did she expect? Instant smooth sailing to the moon with Sailor and Musk? After giving Yellen a platform to bag on Bitcoin with no comparisons and without any journalistic integrity, CNBC proceeded to bring up central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Quote, The Federal Reserve, where, Federal Res- uh, f- where Yellen once served as chair, has studied the issue and discussed the possibility of a new digital currency along with a payment system that expects to roll out over the next several years, it reported. Quote, I think it would result in faster, safer, and cheaper payments, which I think are important goals, Yellen said. <laughs> hmm. Why is it about faster, cheaper, and safer payments when the printing press is killing our savings, supposedly in the name of full employment? I'm just a guy with laser eyes and diamond hands, so make your own opinion. But, I think it's ridiculous when financial regulators and the mass media try to criticize Bitcoin without actually comparing it to fiat when the world's central banks are trying to gouge, I'm sorry, are trying to gauge if they can implement draconian Chinese Communist Party like CBDCs. It's clear that Bitcoin is money. The International Monetary Fund's latest poll reflects this at a 79.9% to 20.1% yes to no. Yeah. Are CBDCs really money though? The entire purpose of a blockchain data structure is to enable decentralized control. Therefore, it's nonsensical when deployed by a central authority that continues to to debase its currency. Are central bank digital currencies really money? And that's 64.5% no to 35.5% yes. Can governments stop Bitcoin? Quote, if no one wants a devaluation of devaluation proof, censorship resistant, permissionless, borderless, non discriminatory, teleporting financial asset, then no one will need no one will feed it energy and it will die, as Alex Golds Gladstone wrote for Quintel. The real question I'd say is not can they stop it, but why in the world would they want to? Yeah, I I agree with that sentiment. Why in the world would they want to? You know, the the fact of the matter is is that cryptocurrencies create a lot of monetary activity that wouldn't otherwise be happening. You know, there's been such a vast destruction of the physical economy over the last several months, or about a year now, uh, that 
we we literally would have stalled entirely by now, I think, if it were not things like cryptocurrencies. And and you know, I was thinking about this the other day, the um the excitement that we've been seeing lately in conventional markets. One of the things I attribute it to is people from crypto getting too big for the limited liquidity pools. You know, it's like they're they're whales in in the uh, limited liquidity pools in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You know, and they either have to spread themselves so thin that they're they're experiencing a lot of loss due to transaction fees and whatnot. And so they're, they're just going to legacy markets instead. You know, when they've got tools like Robinhood that brings a lot of the same experience that they had in cryptocurrency trading directly into conventional markets, it's like, why not? It's, it's, it's another place that you can make money. And when you can do it in a lot of the same ways, again, the, the motivation not to is, is just not there. You know, but beyond that, in order to make any significant significant amount of money, these guys have to put up a lot of money, and they can't really do that in a lot of the the uh, Bitcoin markets and a lot of the altcoin markets because it scares the shit out of people and it blocks the whole market up. You know, where they're looking at you know buy walls that are that are thirteen and fourteen Bitcoin tall, you know, on an altcoin. Those are those are kind of uh, kind of intimidating. They they create for some for some nice action occasionally, but at the same time they're kind of daunting, and they can make the the market slow down quite a bit. So the uh, like I said, I think that the many of many of the bigger traders in crypto have migrated onto conventional markets, and that's. That's one of the reasons why you're seeing a lot of the volatility there that you had not before. It's because they're taking a lot of the same games that they were playing in crypto, and they're playing them in conventional markets, and they're shaking the shit out of everybody there. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down with some music. And, uh, but where'd it go? You know, I haven't played any Steel Panther tonight. I think we should fix that. So... But what song? Here we go. I'm Not Your Bitch by Steel Panther. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Epic by Faith No More. And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. Uh, We will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I want you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole, because nobody else is going to do it for you. And as far as our last dance is concerned, we're going to have to be keeping it short and sweet. So I think we're going to go with 9-inch nails here. And let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Big man with a big gun. Last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. Good night.